Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about the recent survey done by the Henry Jackson think tank, um, which is a survey that they did this year in March of Muslim uh, opinions in the UK. And what we have from that survey are some pretty startling and shocking uh, discoveries or revelations, really that I think as a society we need to be reflecting upon. Because since September the 11th, our political elite have been operating on a principle that states that we can incorporate and assimilate the Muslim community into nice liberal middle class values. Since September the 11th, that's what they've been trying. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. This is, this is something that, as, as a society, we have been buying into for a long time. And the Henry Jackson uh, think tank did a survey of a thousand Muslims about their opinions. And these are some of their findings. And then I want to talk about what that means for the rest of us. So, for instance, the 63% of British Muslims want rooms for public prayer in non-religious places such as in non-faith schools and hospitals. Now, I want to say a couple of things about that, which is that as a society, we have to make a choice about what kind of society do we want to live in. Do we want to live in a liberal secular society? Or do we want to live in a multi-faith society? If we are serious about living in a multi-faith society, then no one should complain about the fact that Muslims want rooms to pray in. Like, because that kind of goes along with the idea of a multi-faith society. But for us as Christians, that lays down a challenge for us. How willing are we as Christians to assert our own principles and our own teachings and to practice our faith as fully, as completely. How are we willing to demand our rights as Christians in a multi-faith society? If we are going to be a multi-faith society, then the Church of England should be de-established. If we're going to have a liberal secular society, then public places of worship in non-religious buildings shouldn't be allowed. As a society, we have to make a choice. We have to start thinking through what are complicated questions. It is not good enough simply to shrug, simply to sulk that you don't like change or you don't like the way things are going. 65% of the Muslims surveyed by the Henry Jackson Society want Eid al-Fitr to be made a public holiday. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to live in a, a multi-faith society, then we can't complain about this. We should allow the Muslims to have Eid al-Fitr as a public holiday but we should also allow the Hindus to celebrate Diwali as a public holiday. And we should also allow the Jews to celebrate Yom Kippur as a public holiday. And we're going to end up with a calendar full of holidays. And don't you doubt for a second that the Jedi group will be demanding that Star Wars Day be made a public holiday. But, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this, why are we taking lectures about having Eid al-Fitr as a public holiday when Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia will not allow Christmas to be a public holiday, will not allow Easter to be a public holiday 
Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that in Saudi Arabia it is illegal, illegal to celebrate Christmas publicly. It's illegal to celebrate Easter publicly. Why are we not more vocal about the oppression of Christianity in the Muslim world? Why do we think that this dialogue about tolerance should be one way? Why are we not demanding that Saudi Arabia allows for Easter processions, for the cross to be processed in the streets of Riyadh, ladies and gentlemen? The Henry Jackman Society found this, that 57% 50 of Muslims asked, felt that it should be made compulsory, ladies and gentlemen, hear that, compulsory to serve halal food in all schools and hospitals. All schools and hospitals. Does that sound like, ladies and gentlemen, the idea of live and let live, or does it sound like an imposition upon your children? Nearly 60% of Muslims want to see a world in which all of your children are forced to eat halal food, ladies and gentlemen. You need to, you need to ask, ladies and gentlemen. Brother, it's all right. It's all right. Don't bite. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, are you investigating your schools and what they are feeding your children? Are you protesting if they are forcing your children to eat halal meat? As a Christian, we cannot eat halal food. It goes against our religion. So why are we not being more vocal in speaking out about this imposition in our schools and in our hospitals? Christians, you must become more vocal. It is your silence and your passivity that is allowing for this imposition. And please note that nearly 60% of Muslims are advocating the compulsory purchase and the compulsory feeding of halal food onto non-Muslims. Why are we not challenging that? Deal with it, he says. I am dealing it with it. Here's what we should do. We should ban halal meat in this country. We should ban halal food in this country. It is a barbaric and savage way to slaughter an animal. It is cruel. It causes them pain and it funds Islamization. So yes, he's right. We should deal with it. We should ban the practice of it. We should make it illegal. They want to impose it upon us. Let us just outlaw it completely, ladies and gentlemen. The Henry Jackson uh, survey found that 52% of Muslims wanted to make it illegal to show pictures of Muhammad in public. We have the right to do it and we should do it and we absolutely must do it precisely because people like him want to impose his religion on other people. Why are you threatening a woman? Why are you threatening a woman? Why are you threatening a woman? Do you see? Do you see how they behave? Do you see how they behave? Put me on camera. I'm standing here. Put me on camera. No, they have the right to film. Why are you harassing women? 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 You got in her face. You got in her face. Why did you get in her face? Why did you touch a woman? Is it haram or halal to touch a woman you don't know? Is it haram or halal to touch a woman you don't know? You touched her on the shoulder. Jihadi trash. This is what we've got to stand against. Because if you allow 
allow them to bully you, they will bully you, ladies and gentlemen. And as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, they seek to try and intimidate us. They seek to try and bully us like this man is trying to do right now. You must stand up to them. You must not be afraid of people like this. You must not allow them to dominate you like they want to. Because if they do, ladies and gentlemen, if they do, I'm going to go and stand back over there now to these guys. If they do, ladies and gentlemen, if they do, my, I'll, in a second, if you do allow them to intimidate you, they will take away your freedom. They will take away your freedom to express yourself like this man tried to do just now when he intimidated a woman. Let me ask you this. Why were you not outraged by his behavior? Why did you allow him to do it without challenge? Where is your courage to stand up to thugs like these two who seek to intimidate us because they think that their religion is superior? No, ladies and gentlemen, Islam is inferior. Muhammad is inferior. Jesus Christ is Lord. And in the Christian faith, we are allowed to use visual representations. And that means we can make visual representations of Muhammad and we should not be intimidated to not do so, ladies and gentlemen. So, why are you grabbing me? Why are you grabbing me? Don't touch. I will talk about Muhammad whenever I want. And why? Why must we talk about Muhammad? Because Muhammad, ladies and gentlemen, is what encourages them to behave like this. That is why they behave like this. And so as Christians, we must find our courage not to be intimidated, not to have our free speech taken by these wannabe jihadis, these Islamist thugs, these enemies of the church, these enemies of our freedom. You're seeing their behavior right in front of you. And if you tolerate it here, it will happen everywhere across the Western world. You have to stand up to them. They're only brave when they're in numbers, ladies and gentlemen. Shortly, shortly. So, so ladies and gentlemen, so ladies and gentlemen, I'll go on, I'll go on. 16% of those interviewed in the Henry Jackson interview said that only 16% of Muslims asked said that it was undesirable to have an Islamic party. Now I personally don't think the Muslims need an Islamic party. They have one. It's called the Labour Party. The Labour Party is already an Islamic party. However, in a liberal democracy, there can be no objection to the Muslims forming an Islamic party. I can't object to it because the Christians have a political party and I support that political party. And so I would welcome a Muslim party. But this should raise awareness amongst us all about the fact that a liberal secular democracy cannot stop Islamization. Liberal secular societies are not able to resist Islamization because you are all educated that you have to tolerate their behavior, that you have to tolerate their attitudes, that you can't stand up to them, that you can't defend yourself against them. The police do nothing. The government does nothing. We as Christians must organize ourselves to protect our own rights and to stand up for our own religion here in the West because the liberal democracies are giving ground to the Islamists 
and you will see that increasingly as things move forward, ladies and gentlemen. So, I'm going to make one more point and then I'll take some questions. The Henry Jackson survey found that only 23%, ladies and gentlemen, of Muslims didn't want to impose Sharia law. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that over 70% of Muslims in the United Kingdom were committed to imposing Sharia law. That Sharia law will turn Christians like me into second-class citizens. It will turn Christians and Jews into second-class citizens. It will allow for the buying and selling of slaves. It will allow, ladies and gentlemen, for Muslims who become Christians to be killed. It will allow, ladies and gentlemen, for the removal of Christians from government and the establishment of a religious apartheid. It will allow for polygamy and secret marriages and abortion, ladies and gentlemen. This kind of law is not something that we should tolerate. It is intolerable to allow an ideology that wants to reintroduce slavery back into the land, or the killing of apostates, or the dimitude of Christians and Jews, ladies and gentlemen. If you are against these things, then you have every right, ladies and gentlemen, to oppose the implementation of Sharia law in this land. But we, ladies and gentlemen, because of our liberal elites, have given ground to this ideology. But I have good news for you. What's the good news, Bob Sila? The good news is that there is an alternative to secular liberalism. There is an ideology that we can embrace that will stand up to the thugs that you saw earlier. It is a muscular Christianity that does not believe that it should tolerate evil, that it should tolerate the Islamists, that it should tolerate those who wish to bring back slavery and dimitude into the land. It believes that we should tackle these ideologies head on, not like liberals, but as Christians, ladies and gentlemen, it isn't more liberal secularism that's going to save us. It is a fervent, powerful commitment to a fully lived Christian civilization. That is how we save ourselves from Islamization. Abandon liberalism and embrace Christianity. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? So, ladies and gentlemen, how do we get from here to establishing a Christian state? It starts, ladies and gentlemen, by Christians consolidating in Benedict communities where we all move in together and we elect Christian politicians who will represent us in Parliament and we evangelize inside our communities and around our communities with the certain belief that Christianity is the answer that our world needs and we seek to establish a Christendom too a second Christendom in Europe. We start from building from the ground up and rejecting liberalism and the enlightenment, ladies and gentlemen. Any other questions? How wedded are you to the teachings of Rome? So, ladies and gentlemen, the question was, how wedded am I to the teachings of Rome? I'm not a Roman Catholic, and so 
My acceptance of Rome's teaching is based upon where I think Rome's teachings embody the apostolic and prophetic teachings of the historical church. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Do you apply what the Bible says or do you go by historical Catholicism? I'm going to ask people, I'll address this question, but then I want people to ask questions based on the topic that I asked. Can I, can I ask you a question? On the topic that I talked about. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Yes. Yes. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Why is it a sin, ladies and gentlemen? Why is it a sin, ladies and gentlemen, for Christians to eat halal meat? Here's why. Is it because the meat is magic? No. Is it because the meat has the power of demons? No. The reason why it is a sin for Christians to eat halal meat why? is because when you buy or purchase or participate in eating the halal meat, you fund Islamization because halal meat is connected to Muslim industry. And in Muslim industry, they have to pay zakat and zakat funds dawah and the building of mosques and Islamization. And it is a sin for a Christian to fund the missionary efforts of other religions. And so, for that reason, it is a sin for Christians to eat halal meat. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, you can come back. So, the natural analogy that the brother picks up on is should Christians boycott Muslim businesses? Yes, they should boycott Muslim businesses. Christians should shop at Christian businesses. And we should only shop at businesses that are not Christian when we don't have a choice. And when we don't have a choice between lots of different non-believing ideologies, we choose the lesser of two evils. And the lesser of two evils is to shop in the liberal shop rather than the Muslim shop. Any other question? You wanted to come back. Yep. That's correct. Boycotting one isn't strong, in my opinion. Um, so, what's your question? So, the question is if Paul says, don't ask, it's okay to eat. So, the question is, ladies and gentlemen, Paul said, don't ask, ladies and gentlemen. If you are a guest in someone's house and they serve you food, you have no reason to ask, ladies and gentlemen. However, if you know that something is halal, then you should not participate in eating it. And we should make it public policy that all halal meat has to be openly declared so that Christians can boycott and Muslims can eat. Ladies and gentlemen, the way that a consumerist society works is it bends itself around the consumer. If it bends itself around the consumer and you are an invisible consumer, then it won't bend around you. But it will bend around those that make a song and a dance about something. And that is why Muslims, even though they make up a smaller percentage of our society, are having a different differential impact upon it. So we Christians must be more robust, more outward and more forceful in expecting that we should practice our religion in public. And that means refusing to eat halal. It's got nothing to do with whether it was blessed to Allah or not, because that blessing was to a false god and that god doesn't exist. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Is there a Bible reference to what you're saying of, of eating halal as a sin? 
So why is it a sin, ladies and gentlemen? It is understood by all Christians that we should not participate in sin. And spreading falsehood and spreading that which is untrue is a sin. So even if you don't spread Islam, but you fund the spreading of Islam, you have participated in the spreading of falsehood. And that is why it's a sin. Because as Christians, we should be about spreading the truth, not about spreading falsehood. It says in the Bible, do not be unevenly yoked with the unbeliever. The unbeliever, in this case, is the Muslim and halal meat. If we are funding halal meat, we're funding dawah, and so we are yoked with the unbeliever. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Um, so, just having said what you said, um, myself being a new Christianity boss here, working Congratulations. In, thank you very much. Working at the NHS, I've got Muslim friends. Yep. Um, finding it hard to traverse what you're saying, those aspects of it. I agree with you. Yep. How do I go about my daily life? I mean, I, I do, I'm very drawn to apologetics and things like that, and I'm trying to take as many opportunities as I can. Yep. Okay, so how do you live it? So brother, you've got to remember that you have as many rights as any Muslim in the NHS. So whatever the Muslims can do, and the NHS permits them to do it, you have the right to do it. They don't, they don't say to you, they don't go in, get involved in Easter parties and Christmas parties, and they refuse to eat meat that's not halal, so you can refuse to participate in celebrations of Eid and you can refuse to eat halal meat and if they use the prayer room, you can use the prayer room and if, you can, if the Muslims can say, well I can't do this because of my religion then you can say, I can't do this because of my religion it's about knowing your rights and about asserting your rights according to your Christian faith now obviously, you have to do that with wisdom you have to do that with respect. You have to do that with, um, with uh, diplomacy. You don't just barge into your manager's office, stamp on the desk and say, D give me this, I won't do that. You've got to do it in an intelligent way according to a workplace. But you're not doing anything wrong by asserting your rights. And that's what we're talking about. So you, for instance, if they serve halal meat, and they don't serve any other kind of meat, you can write in a letter a complaint saying, as a Christian, I can't eat halal meat. I require that the canteen serves non-halal meat for those that don't eat halal meat. And then you demand your rights and you organize other Christians to demand the same rights. Right, so this is a good point is that a lot of Christians don't think this way. And they don't think this way because they've been educated by the Enlightenment to think that their religion is just something that they should do privately. But that doctrine is not a Christian doctrine. Our faith is to be lived like a city on a hill, like a light that can be seen by all. That means that it is meant to be lived publicly. It is meant to be lived in a way that can be seen. It is meant to be salt to this earth. So it is meant to have a preserving and protecting and transformative effect upon the world around us. But a lot of Christians have not been educated around that because they're still learning from the Enlightenment and not from Jesus Christ. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Any other questions going once? So, great question. What about buying food from a Jewish shop, ladies and gentlemen? In terms of whether a Christian can eat kosher, as it is... I'm going to come to that. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
If that money is used by Jewish businesses to resist the gospel, then Christians should boycott Jewish businesses for exactly the same reasons. Because as Christians, we must not fund that which opposes the Christian gospel. And so if Jewish businesses, like Muslim businesses, are funding that which opposes the church, then we should boycott them. However, if you can't shop at a Christian shop, and you can't shop at a liberal shop, and the only shop that you can buy from is a Jewish shop, then buy from the Jewish shop. If the only shop that you can buy from is a Muslim shop, then buy from the Muslim shop because you still need to eat. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? What about if I have the choice between a Muslim shop and a Jewish shop? Which one should I buy to If the only choice if the only choice faced by a Christian was to buy between a Muslim shop and a Jewish shop, I would buy at the Jewish shop. Why? Because the Jews only resist the evangelization of Jews, but Muslims seek to convert Christians. And so the lesser of the two evils is to buy with the Jews. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Have you come across this document? No, I haven't. Well, it's for you, and it will help you. I'll talk to you later. I'll take it. I'll talk to you later. What's your question, sir? Um, don't you think that a complaint should be made under the hate speech law in, in uh, Scotland on the basis that every Muslim, including the First Minister, says every day, um, lead us on a straight path, which is unexceptionable, and I agree with, not on the path of those who have gone astray, and not on the part of those on whom the wrath of God rests. Indeed. Okay, I'll, I'll get, take that question. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the hate speech laws are going to bite everybody in the ass. Every day, Muslims pray a curse upon the non believers. They pray curses upon non believers. That Allah will frustrate our plans, that Allah will cause us to be confounded. Every single day they make those kinds of prayers. If ever you see those prayers being made public in Scotland, you should complain using the hate speech laws of Scotland against the Muslim that makes those prayers. Because it is hate speech, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, sir, I'm taking your question. Use the Scottish hate speech laws as a weapon because they were designed to be used as a weapon. But the liberals and the left wing designed them to use against the political right and to use against Christians. So Christians become activists and use those laws against those from the left and from Islam that speak hatred against the rest of us. So every time an Imam in a mosque is filmed calling for the destruction of Israel or for the establishment of Sharia, use those laws to demonstrate that he's practicing hate speech. Because only when we weaponize these laws will these laws be abolished ladies and gentlemen, but do use them. Any other questions? Um, I suppose that Muslims lie most of the time, um, and they would lie about what they said. How do we prove that? You have to video everything. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to caution people from making statements that are clumsy. It is a very clumsy statement, Auntie to say Muslims lie, because that's not true. There are lots of honest Muslims. So it's very clumsy to say that Muslims lie. But it is true to say that Muslims can lie. And some Muslims do lie. It's called taqiyya. The only way to expose taqiyya is to actually know what you're talking about and when a Muslim says something that is false, 
confront them with the evidence, ladies and gentlemen. And we've done that in the corner for six years. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Any other question about Christianity or what I'm talking about today? Going once, going twice. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Final time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go on to another topic. I said any other, no, I said any other questions. You had your chance. Oh, oh, wait, you know, I can wait, mate. Right, do you want to ask some questions? So, Go on, ask yeah, questions. So a couple of questions, Bob. It's, you know, we've just gone past the Easter period. Yes. And everyone was looking out for Bob. Yep. So, where were you, sir, during Easter? Okay, the most boring question is a question about me. I'd rather have questions about my faith. But I was on, I was celebrating the start of Easter. And I didn't want to be here on the most joyous day of the year. Easter Sunday is more important than Christmas for Christians. It is more important than any other holiday for the Christian. And Easter, and Easter is still being celebrated right now. We're celebrating Easter for 50 days. So we're still celebrating Easter. This is the third Sunday of Easter. And on the first Sunday of Easter, the most important day of the Christian year, I didn't want to be here because here is toxic and negative and confrontational. And on such a beautiful and holy day, I wanted to be in church and I wanted to be with my family and I wanted to be with my friends. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? So, but, go on, yeah, go on, ask another question. So when you're talking about it's toxic, oh, they didn't tell us. you know, elaborate specifically on Speaker's Corner. What is it about this environment which you are part of that is toxic? Okay, the second most boring kind of question is a question about the corner. I'd rather take questions about my faith. However, why is Speaker's Corner a toxic atmosphere, ladies and gentlemen? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, ladies and gentlemen, why it's toxic. Do you remember this thug here that just tried to pull a fist at me just then, like the coward that he is? That's why it's toxic. Did you catch him on camera? Did you see him look like he was going to punch me just then? Sneaky, cowardly punch. That's why this place is toxic. I come here then? Because of people like him. Because of these jihadi scum who think that they have the right to do what they want and the police allow them to do it. And many of you men, ladies and gentlemen, many of you men allow them to do it because you don't stand up to them. These kinds of people bring a toxicity. Speaker's Corner is about public debate. It is about argument. It's about discussion and the challenging of ideas. That's what Speaker's Corner is supposed to be about. But as you saw, that little piece of trash just tried to take a swing at me and his other jihadi dog touched a woman touched a woman and tried to intimidate a woman and we caught it on camera. That's why Speaker's Corner is toxic because of Islamist filth in this country and Islamist filth in this park that we should all be standing up to every single You're not Sunday. A Christian, are you? Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Why don't you Thanks forgive them? Can. Okay. I'll catch you later on. And later on, Bob, with your permission, one of my followers on YouTube, her name is Ace99, wants to talk to you on the phone, but on live. Yeah, we'll do that. Are you happy to do yeah, that? Yeah, we'll organise it. So, Ace99. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions about the Christian faith? This is your chance. Go on. Yes. 
I wasn't here when the so-called jihadist uh, went to hit the woman or whatever happened. And as a Muslim, I will apologise. What's your question, sir? My, my question is, what is it that happened in that altercation to make to uh, instigate that reaction? Okay, so what happened, bro, is that one of the Muslims in this park touched this woman because she was filming in this park. Now you tell me as a Muslim, is that halal or haram? That's haram. Haram, exactly. Wait, wait, wait. If you want to debate, we'll debate. I'm taking we questions. Well, I've got, a, I've got a point of discussion for you if you want to debate. We can have a discussion. Okay, let's have a discussion. And then I'll let you reply. And la ladies and gentlemen, this is the guy. This is the guy. This is the guy that took a swung at me. This is the Aki that took a swung at me. You're a representative of Islam. Look at you. You're a representative of Islam. Bro, yes you are. A bad one. You're a bad one. He said it. Right, if you take a swing at me, I've got a Quran under my arm. If you take a swing at me, that Quran will be dropped. Stop my dick, boy. Just stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Right. Look at the Islamist. This, this person is not representing Islam right now. Look how you come out. Leave it. Leave it. You're asking your sins. Look at behaving. And he can keep it a secret. From his first This is the guy. This is the guy. Sorry, mate. This is the guy that just swung at me. This is the Aki. That's not. He should. He should. He should. Yeah. No, he should swipe him. Yeah. Do you want to get down camera? What do you say? He should swipe him. Bro, bro, you're looking you. If you take a swing at me, I've got a Quran under my arm. If you take a swing at me, that will Look at that one. Look at Look at that one. Look at that one. Look at that one. Look at that one. Look at I would never ever say that someone is not Muslim. What I can say is that right now his behavior yeah. is not in This is oh why we God. must stand up to them. Oh, what do you mean them? Them. No, because these no, 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 no. Islamists. Islamists? These myself, Islamists. Is he a Muslim? I am myself am a Muslim. I would never ever say that someone is not a Muslim. What I can say is that right now his behavior is not in accordance with the way that it should be. But I will never say that he is not a Muslim. My, man is, my man is straying. That's why we should stand up to them. My man is straying. Right. Man is straying. 